Hey, welcome to the Keep the Faith podcast. I am your host, Tori. And with me today, I have a special guest, Miss Nia Nicole, with me today. And I hope you guys had a great weekend. I know I did. What did you do this over the weekend? I hope you had a great weekend. Matter of fact, Nia, I'm, I was so excited. We, we actually planned this um, interview, what, a couple of weeks ago? Or, and I've been looking forward to it. And of course, like I tell everyone, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, because I hear you're a Jersey girl. Jersey in a hat. <laughs> Well, hello. My name is Nina Cole. I'm an international speaker, author, and master vision coach. So I am from New Jersey, and I recently transplanted here in South Carolina um, as a part of this journey that I'm on. We're going to talk a little bit about that when it comes to my book. But I wrote a book um, about three years ago as a result of going through a divorce and, you know, God is doing some amazing things, um, helping me to find my purpose in the pain, but I have three beautiful children. I'm a grandma. Really? Yes. I'm a grandmother of four and, um, my granddaughter, I'm a shout out little pre pre. <laughs> um, she just recently went viral on TikTok. The little girl, um, Doing a you better work dance, whatever. Anyway, but I'm very, really proud. I'm a I'm a goofy grandma. I'm very proud of her, but all of the kids. But so that's me. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm a grandma. Okay. And a devout Christian. I love me some Jesus. <laughs> me too. And this is what the title of this particular segment is called Finding Purpose in the Midst of the Pain. So we talked off uh, the air in regards to different areas that we can go. So I'm going to let you, I'm going to give the keys to you and allow you to drive. So wherever you want to start, I'm going to ask you questions based on wherever you want to start. So wherever you want to start in regards to different types of traumas or pains that you have experienced in life. Okay. I'm giving you the keys. All right. <laughs> so um, I can go a lot of different places. Um, what I like to say too, professionally, I'm a social worker. So I do provide um, therapy for children in a children's system of care um, for kids that's been through multiple traumas. And um, a part of my story and the reason why I'm here, it seems like almost everything that I've been through personally, God used it for ministry and to help empower other people. And I used to think like, basically, why me? <laughs> why some of the challenges that I've faced in my life? Um, some of uh, my testimonies that I was a teen mom. I had my first child at 17. And then I was told by my guidance counselor at the time that, yeah, you probably shouldn't you know, go to college. You should probably focus on the work field, you know, since you have a child. And it might have been like some, you know, good advice, so he thought. But it really discouraged me because I had all of these ambitions and dreams. And to make a long story short, um, many of the things that I've experienced, God allowed me to give it back. So the first job, I, I ended up going to college, <laughs> um, getting my bachelor's in criminal justice and my master's in organizational leadership. And the first job I got out of college was at an adolescent group home for teenage mothers. So um, the, the whole purpose of me writing a book or just sharing some things that God taught me through my pain is that you never want to waste a hurt. If you have trauma, you have issues, you have difficulties you go through, you don't want to waste that. You want to know, what am I supposed to be learning? And once you learn it, how can I help heal other people in their process as they're learning as well? So um, I don't know. We can talk about adolescent parenting. I was on welfare before. Um, I, you know, I went through a divorce. We can go wherever you want to go. But the premise of me writing the book was learning how to examine these purposeful moments in your life. Start with being an adolescent teenage mom. 
Because for the teacher to tell you, basically, for you not to pursue your dreams, a lot of times that can kill your dream. That could have put you in a tailspin of depression. You know, a lot of times you have to be very careful what you say to people because it can totally cure their dreams and make them not want to dream anymore. So touch on that uh, initially. To start oh, off. Oh, it did kill my dreams. <laughs> really? They had to be resurrected. So, I mean, I'm from Trenton, New Jersey, which is a, you know, inner city area in New Jersey, and there was a lot going on. I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. So, you know, it was the war on drugs, the crack epidemic. It was like a lot going on. So, a lot of my peers, they were having children. I, you know, I had children. So, um, however, I was raised by very strict parents. And my parents, like, had all of these aspirations for me. Oh, go to school. I did well. I was a um, performance-based person. So I did well until I got to high school. And, I, you know, I don't know. I started liking the boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's because I was so sheltered. I didn't really, uh, and naive, I didn't really have... Um, I guess the wisdom to navigate date in life. Basically, my parents was like, don't do it. Right. <laughs> right. So, you know, I started liking the boys. And then I, you know, of course, I got pregnant. And at that point, I was like, wait, I had a whole plan. <laughs> My parents wanted me to graduate from high school, go to college, then get married and have children. But look, I'm 17. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in Planned Parenthood petrified right you know um like what am I gonna do now mm -hmm. what I'm gonna do now but the daughter that I had in high school she has given me some of the greatest purpose of my entire life after having her I realized nah I gotta let her know you can bounce back from anything so she her life really kind of inspired me but yeah I was told by my guidance counselor and um, it took me a long time to overcome it. I had to get on welfare. And I was with my daughter's father. He, I married him. We married each other um, after high school at around 19. But anyway, I had to be on welfare, Medicaid, food stamps. Um, I was humiliated a lot mm -hmm. sitting in that office asking people for help. Um, even when I wanted child care, they were like, well, you have to do a welfare to work program. Right. You can't go to college. I'm like, but I'm a good student. Right. I want to go to school. I had to take my kids to school with me. Sometimes I had people in the hallways just watching my kids while I'm in class wow. or pushing a stroller in there. It was deep. But I thank God that I didn't waste that hurt. You know, God um, helped me to help others. So when I see people, young women, and that type of predicament, I'm like, girl, please. You could get through this, honey. Right, right. <laughs> you right. can get through this. Because a lot of times, I know when I was growing up, and I think if I'm not mistaken, we're about the same age as up. I haven't had my birthday yet. So, okay. Um, but um, I know when I was growing up, a lot of people would say that once you have a child, especially as a teenager, that that will basically stop your dreams. Mm -hmm. And that is not the case. You are a prime example that that is not the case at all. And then a lot of times, too, you can get on the system and sometimes you rely on the system. You can become lazy and you, can, you have to make a determination within yourself to tell yourself, is this what I want for my life? Mm -hmm. Is this what I want for my children? So you got to be very determined. And I also believe that you have to have the right people around you. Mm -hmm. Because if you have the wrong people around you, they can lead you. They can spin you off in a deeper depression. Mm -hmm. And I've known that for, for me personally, when I changed my circle, mm -hmm. it changed my life. Right. So I, I really commend you for, you know, because like I said, you could have stayed on the system because some people, they get on the system and they rely on the system mm -hmm. and they stay there. Sure. But you have to have that determination. So let's go topic um, in regards to now you said you had a total of, is it three children? Three children. And I had all three of my children by the time I was 21. Really? So, yeah, it was it was rough. It, I, let me just bring this out. People need to be aware that it wasn't that I was so gung-ho and motivated and thought I can get through those circumstances. It was rough sometimes. I suffered from depression. I suffered from anxiety. There's times in my life I was suicidal. Mm -hmm. I would say, God, just 
I can't do this anymore. Right. It was rough. And I thank God that I had parents that knew God and wouldn't let me stay in the state that I was in. And I learned a lot through perseverance. I think I learned more about God and my purpose as a result of the things I've been through more than a preached sermon, more than someone telling me this is what God wants for my life. It's the experiences, my lows, where God really had to reach way down right. and get me out of those circumstances. But um, I really, I, I'm like, I really talk about God's grace in my book. The, the title of my book is called Grace to Live on Purpose because some people feel like they've been counted out after they made bad choices yes. in life. Yes. And they feel like, oh, there's no recovery. My book the message that God gives me in my life is all about being able to not just recover, but pursue God's purpose in, in your life based on his grace. Like you never want to waste this pain. When you go through things, start asking yourself, what should I be learning? And once I learn this, how can I help someone learn this? Probably um, easier without certain um, situations, but yeah. It was rough. And see, a lot of times what I know I'm guilty of this. A lot of times what we do, especially with with females, we focus too much on the pain mm -hmm. instead of reversing it. Like you said, pay attention to what what should I be learning out of this? And then sometimes, you know, when we were talking off the air, like I go through my periods of isolation mm -hmm. and sometimes that could be healthy. And sometimes it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. But when you go those, through those periods, when you have those right people around you, you're going to have those people that reach out to you like, Tori, are you okay? Nia, are you okay? Instead of saying, well, Nia didn't answer my call. <laughs> she didn't answer my text. What's going on? Instead of just automatically, you know, being negative about it. Sometimes you realize that maybe they're going through something. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're dealing with something that they don't want to talk about. And in their timing, they will talk about it. But you, we live in a day age, we want to microwave, we in a microwave society, want everything mm -hmm. to happen quickly. Right. And then a lot of times it's crazy to me, which I don't understand how some people, they have the good people around them. They have people encouraging them. And instead of talking to the people that are around you, you go to the keyboard and you express yourself on social media. Oh, okay. And then you have the audacity. To get upset when people are in your business. Right, right. But my thing is this when if you don't put it out on social media, people do not know what to attack. Mm -hmm. But when you put it in an atmosphere, of course they're gonna attack it. Right. right. So I mean, there's just so many things, but I also want to touch on that there were some other things that I wrote down. I was at some pin points as well. Um, how do you know? One of the questions I wanted to ask, because we all been through some type of drama. And and you can take this however you want to, whether it be relationships, family, friend, whatever. How do you know within yourself when to be patient with someone or when to let them go? Wow, that is <laughs> such a great and powerful question. Yeah, you know, I want to start by saying this. One of the most difficult challenges I've had personally is knowing how to have boundaries, like boundaries are necessary um, because I was a people pleaser. I wanted to be, you know, helpful, you know, the perfect little helper, you right. know, I wanted to be the obedient child. And it just, I even touch on this in my book too, how I had to deal with the deep root of why am I such a people pleaser? Why don't I know how to have boundaries to keep myself safe? Why do I allow people to continue to hurt me and to harm me emotionally, physically, whatever? Um, what I learned through that process is that you have to do the hard work within yourself. Before you can set boundaries, you got to know what the core is. You can't have someone removed from your life if there's a dependence that you have that you're not addressing because all you're going to do is invite another person just like that into your life. Right. 
So you're like, why does this person keep hurting me? And then you end up being with somebody else. It's like, why do I attract the same type of guy? Or why do I have the same type of friendships? Because there's some inner core work that right. you more likely have to do. And I did that through prayer and through therapy. Mm-hmm. Now, I believe in therapy. A lot of church people and a lot of people of color mm-hmm. will not take the time and go and get some help because we experience generational trauma. I can go down a tangent with that, but what I want to say, what worked for me is finding out the root cause. Why do I, I know you asked about how do you set boundaries or how you have people that are negative out of your life and out of your mm-hmm. circle. You have to figure out what they're giving to you. What, what am I getting out of this relationship? Cause we only keep going back because there's something that we're getting. Right. right. It's something that we're getting. Right. And I had to realize that, you know, my father has always been like a profound influence on my life and always has been there. And I remember as a, a young girl, I always wanted to please my dad because he and my mother had separated when I was a kid. And for some reason, I don't know if it, I watched too many Cosby show episodes or whatever, <laughs> but I just, I needed that family. And mm-hmm. because they had been apart for so long, I started to interpret that as, you know, I wasn't good enough. You know, people don't realize when families break up, children start thinking that it's their fault. They're the reasons. So I had that deep seed within me um, that I translated into getting married and, and, and needing, that's why I'm asking you, like, what are you getting from the person? I had to go back and have conversations with my dad. And, um, he's such an amazing guy. He's such an amazing guy. And I learned that I was trying to fix a relationship between me and him by the relationships that I was getting in with other people. So back to your original question, how do mm-hmm. you know who mm-hmm. to get out your life? Mm-hmm. You have to know, number one, what are they giving to me? Mm-hmm. Number two, what's the root cause? Right. Where did that need come from? Then go back to the need. And once you address the need, then you won't have that same type of need to have unhealthy people in your life. You're absolutely right. Because I believe that when you don't learn the lesson, and like you said, address the need, then you're going to that follow that same pattern or repeating that same, you know, meeting, like you said, meet the same, the same type of guy. They may look, look different, but they're the same person in reality. And one of the other things I was going to ask is that we have to make a choice, a constant choice when it comes to pain. We have the choice whether we allow that pain to make us better or bitter. Mm -hmm. So could you touch base on that? Like, how did you get to the point where you didn't allow your pain to make you become this bitter person because every one of us, Mm -hmm. not all of us had the encouraging, um, whether it be family, we didn't have those encouraging people in our lives. We didn't have people that, you know, you know, a lot of us didn't, you know, didn't grow, even though I grew up in a church, but everybody did not go grow up in church. So of course you're in survival mode, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So you're, you're, you're making the option, especially if you go through hurt and trauma and trauma, some people, they become bitter. Mm -hmm. But we have to make decisions to become better. And like you said earlier, you got to learn from these experiences. One word, forgiveness. Forgive yourself Mm -hmm. and forgive others. That's it. It's nothing more deeper than that. We become bitter. Um, I was reading a book that talks about um, why we struggle with jealousy, anger, greed, Um, all of these uh, guilt and the behaviors that manifest as a result of it. And at its core, we become bitter when we can't either number one, forgive someone for what they've done to us. Or number two, we can't forgive ourselves for what we did to someone else. And um, there's a quote that says unforgiveness is like, Drinking deadly poison every day, Mm -hmm. but hoping that the other person dies. Right. So forgiveness, when you learn to be kind to yourself and kind to others, people, there's like a a cycle of pain. You hurt me. I hurt you back. Then I hurt somebody else. 
and so on and so forth. And the cycle just keeps going. Somebody has to say, wait, the pain cycle has to stop somewhere. So I will choose to forgive somebody. Now, check this out. You got to forgive someone when they don't even ask for forgiveness. Mm. Yes. Yes. You may never get the apology. Mm. You read in my mind. I was about to say something in regards to apology. But go ahead. You may never get it, but you got to forgive them anyway. And one of the things I practice in my prayers um, for forgiveness, forgiveness doesn't mean that you don't have boundaries and you allow the person to continue to come back into your life and do the same things over and over again. Forgiveness is canceling the debt. Mm. It just means you don't owe me anything anymore. You don't occupy the same space in my life anymore. Right. But you don't owe me anything. I, I don't want any harm to come to you. I don't want to retaliate against you. It's like I cancel your debt. Right. You don't owe me nothing. Right. Live your life. I live mine. Right. I'm and, over there. <laughs> right. Right. Like I, I saw a, a quote from because I listen, I love the church. I love the Lord. But I also I'm a big fan of Tupac. <laughs> and to <laughs> And Tupac, I read a quote the other day and he said, um, it was a, a quote from Tupac and he said that, um, j you know, I basically, and I may misquote it, but basically what he was saying is, I want you to eat, but just not at my table. You know what I mean? Girl. Listen, you, I want to see you eat. I want to see you win. And I want to see, you know what I'm saying? Just not at my table. You know what I mean? <laughs> First of all, that is the most articulate and profound way to explain forgiveness because yeah. I just had a conversation with someone and sometimes people pleasers, like I was, I'm a reformed people pleaser, okay? <laughs> um, what we do is we think forgiveness means I forgive you so I keep giving you the same access to me. Because mm -hmm. so, people's like, if you forgive me, why are you holding grudges? It's like, I don't hold grudges, I hold a boundary. Right. Before I was just super duper permeable. That means you can say anything, do whatever. And I thought in my mind that forgiveness meant that, okay, so you just allow that person to have the same type of access. Like, let me give you an example. If someone comes to my house and they steal something out of my home, okay, Rolex watch, expensive pocketbook, okay, I can choose to press charges with the authority, or I can choose to say, you know what? It's fine. But that don't mean you invited to the barbecue. Right. I'm not going to press charges. I'm not going to go to the authorities. I'm not going to require you to do any time for the, what you stole from me. You got that. You keep it. Right. I'm not even angry about it. Right. I'm not even impacted by it, but you're no longer allowed in my personal property or my um, personal area. And I think a lot of people get messed up and hurt a lot. Because they don't have boundaries. Right. And they think forgiveness means be a doormat. Uh -huh. <sighs> a reconciliation. And, re and guess what? You can mm -hmm. reconcile, but I don't mm -hmm. have to have the same level of relationship with you. Yeah. Like people ask me about um, my motivation for writing this book was a multiple multiplicity of things. But one of the biggest things was my divorce. Mm -hmm. So God let me see a lot about myself. And um, it's like, I still love my husband, but where the space that he occupies in my life, yeah, I'm going to deal with that differently right. going forward. And I want him to be okay. And I want him to find God's love and his grace. And I still talk to him almost every day. People are like, what? Yeah, I do. Right. Because at the end of the day, I know that my healing comes from not just exercise and forgiveness, but knowing that I've been forgiven. Right. We have to give people the same amount of grace that God gives us. Girl. So how can we possibly, <laughs> if God is giving us grace, how can we not extend that grace to others? Absolutely. And I tell people all the time, the re people that are um, unforgiving and that seem angry all the time are the people who basically is telling God those people should be punished, but not me. Right. Like I do wrong things, but guess what? My wrong things is not really that bad. Mm -hmm. I had to really look at myself and like, you know what? I contributed to the downfall of my marriage. It wasn't, it's not just one sided relationships rarely are. Right. They rarely are. 
So if I am to believe that God is going to grace me and forgive me through this, then I have to demonstrate that for other people. Absolutely. You have to demonstrate it. It's just so God is much easier than people really understand him to be. We make him complicated. We do. We do. And back to what you said <laughs> earlier in regards to the apology, like a lot of times we hold our healing up because we are waiting on the apology. I have been guilty of this before in my 20s. I'm in my 40s now. I know better. So now I'm doing better. But sometimes you can know better and still don't do what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm older and much wiser and I've experienced some things, I'm at a point where I can give people grace. And just like you said, you can still talk to them, but they do have to set those necessary boundaries mm -hmm. because a person can, can come into your life. They can hurt you tremendously. When some cases it can be intentional, mm -hmm. some cases it can be unintentional, mm -hmm. but we still have to have the capacity to forgive no matter what, either whether you get the apology or not, mm -hmm. it's still our right to forgive them and we are responsible for our own healing. Girl, <laughs> <laughs> you just, girl, you just said a mouthful and that is so true. The reason why we hold grudges and we're angry all the time is because we're expecting the person who hurt us to heal us. Right. It's like that doesn't even make any sense. Right. You know, uh, the fact that we all have trauma, like when you come into relationships, whether they're friendships, platonic, husband, wife, parent, child, we come to it with a myriad of experiences. So I'll share a little bit about my husband and I. Our testimony is that we both came in with trauma. We were kid for, kids, first of all. I was 17 when I got pregnant. He was 19 at the time. And he had already had a child. So he came. Um, his, his father was um, passed away earlier in his life. Didn't really have that modeling. And we grew up in the 80s and 90s. Y'all know what was going on. Right, right. <laughs> you know what was going on. Yes. So we just was like, okay, we're going to do this relationship thing and it's all going to work out. But no, we had so many childhood traumas that we had, didn't deal with. Mm -hmm. When we brought them together, we was just two crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Trying to be adults. And we had not matured ourselves. And we ended up hurting each other a lot, a lot. And then we gave our life to God and we masked a lot of the pain by going to the building, going to church. Right. But we weren't dealing with the core problems that we had. Right. And it wasn't until the divorce and it wasn't until I, I talk about this in my book, all hell broke loose. Right. That we had to sit and I personally had to examine, okay, what is going on? And when I tell you, that I am more authentic today than I ever been in my entire life. And the pain brought me here. Right. I found purpose in my pain. That is, that's so amazing how that works. That Girl. pain is what births your purpose. That's what births your purpose. And I'm actually looking at some of the comments. I didn't want to get distracted, but I'm gonna go through some of the comments and we go through. But another thing that I want to um, say as well when you get to that point where, and I think the most purest love is being able to look at the person that hurt you and you're able to genuinely and authentically forgive, genuinely love them from a pure place and be able to pray for them. Girl. <laughs> and that's the key right there. And, and the reason why at this point, and we're all a work in progress, pro progress excuse me, mm -hmm. I'm able to do that for that particular re relationship because God had to show me me. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we are unforgiven because we assume that we're blameless. Oh, yes. We assume that we're blameless mm -hmm. because the people that hold grudges, the people that can't forgive, are oftentimes people who are kind of self-righteous and they feel like, how could this happen to me? And I was there, so I can testify to that, honey. Yeah. But it wasn't until God showed me my vulnerability in areas of my life where I hurt him, hurt my kids, hurt other people, that I was able to say, man, you were gracious to me. Thank you. Right. 
And that's when I was able to really love him and others from a, a, a genuine place. God had put me on this whole quest of asking people for forgiveness as I'm writing this book because he's, he's showing me a lot of different things. And I wrestled, girl. Mm-hmm. I was like, why should I ask them for forgiveness? They hurt me. They did this. They did this. God said, do it. And every time I did it, God opened up another door and he healed me in ways that nothing else could. Nothing else. Could. I am proud of the person I am today. Wow. That's good. Authentic. Yeah. No more plastic life. Right. Because we'll, we'll have the mask on Girl. before the before COVID, before the actual mask came. We was wearing a mask long before COVID. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's very um, real that you have to be authentically who you are. And you have to allow, and I, because I, I just realized this past week that there are some people that I can be around and I cannot be who I am truly authentically. So I was like, you know, what is it with me? What is it about this person where I feel like I have to be something that I'm not mm. or I have to pretend? So I had to reevaluate just this past week. I was reevaluating myself. Like, why do I feel like I have to be a certain way around this person? Mm. But then there's some people I could just let my hair down and just be who I am authentically. But there's some people I just I don't know. I just feel like I have to put on a facade. And just put any, you know, and it's like, and some people, if you take your blinders, blind, blinders off mm-hmm. and allow them to see who you really are, they look at you like, really? Because I can be goofy sometimes. And even though I love the Lord and I love church, I still occasionally like to listen to hip hop. I like to dance. And like I was telling you, I don't think you, I was telling you like on Fridays, I start doing karaoke. And, it, prior, <laughs> and prior to doing karaoke, like, it's allowing me to come out of my shell because I would be cooped up in the house. All I'm doing is reading books Mm -hmm. and watching. I don't watch a lot of television, but karaoke is helping me come out of my shell Mm -hmm. because of different traumas that I've been through. I was sheltering myself because I was putting up instead of, I feel as though a lot of times, and I know I can only talk about me. Like a lot of times, instead of putting up, we put up, walls Mm -hmm. and when you put up walls you shut everybody out you have to learn i say to put up gates and that way you can let people in let people out and set those (laughs) yeah you got to put in put up the gate like this person you know and set those necessary boundaries and it's okay i was and i realized probably about a month ago Mm -hmm. that i too was a people pleaser because I had trouble with saying no. Like, I'm a big supporter of, you know, when people start their business, I like to support everybody. Right. But I have to tell myself, I can't be to every event. There's sometimes I got to say no. And it's hard for me to say no sometimes. Like, Tori, will you come and support me? And and I sometimes don't want to go. I may not feel like going. Girl. But guess what? (laughs) I'm doing it. And I'm like, why? Why can't I just say no? Why just can't I, you know, say I'm not available or just be honest, like, or I'm- just say no. <laughs> That's an option. And it's a complete sentence. No is a complete sentence. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, my sister and I joke. It's just the two of us. And yeah. um, she would say all the time because I grew up, I'm the oldest. Mm-hmm. And I was performance based because the expectations was always you do the right thing. You be the mo- role model, all this kind of stuff. But my baby sister said to me, sister, that's what she called me. No was a complete sentence. Yeah. You don't always have to offer an explanation to love yourself, to love your peace and to love your time. Like why we love people more than we love ourselves. Then guess what? We are not loving those people because even the Bible teaches us we have to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Mm. So while we out here just doing this for this person, doing this for this person, we think we're demonstrating love. No, we're not. You can't love people and not love yourself. Well, wow. I learned how to say no. Um, what an oh. One of the things you were talking about and about boundaries. Okay, listen. So in my book, Grace to Live on Purpose is available on um, Amazon.com and BarsandNobles.com. But listen, check this out. One of my biggest challenges as a Christian when I was going through this process, learning about myself, is when I first gave my life to God. I was such a weirdo. (laughs) (laughs) I was such a weirdo because I could not understand the difference between 
separation and isolation. Mm -hmm. Okay. You you were talking about going to karaoke and opening up yourself. Let me tell you, I was so weird that once I gave my life to Christ, I thought I couldn't hang around my cousins, my family. I come from a very big, loving, interacting, loud, obnoxious family. And Mm -hmm. I love it. But when I gave my life to Christ, I was on a younger end and my family was still, you know, doing what they did. Mm -hmm. So I would, I literally became a recluse. So it was just me, my husband and my children, my mom and dad and go to church. I was so depressed. I had anxiety because my understanding was that this is what God wanted for me because people kept the way I was being taught people preaching different things about, you know, don't hang around your family members. And I would, let me tell you what I used to do. That's why I set up such a weirdo. I thank God for your deliverance. Amen. (laughs) My family members would have events like baby showers. If they were not married, this is what I used to do. I said, I can't go because you had the baby out of wedlock because this is what I thought Mm -hmm. separation was. Mm -hmm. You know how many family members I hurt because of my ridiculous thinking? Yeah. My sister, I keep going back to her. She taught me so much. I had a a favorite cousin too, who we did everything together. Everything. We grew up together. We're not that far apart in age. And when I gave my life to God, I thought I couldn't be around her. Right. And I hurt her. Mm -hmm. And looking back in retrospect, I wasn't living an authentic life for Christ. I was living totally out of fear. And sometimes being in church. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. They probably going to get you and get me when I say this. Some people in church don't really understand the gospel message. They they can be there for years. They don't understand grace. Mm-hmm. It's like Jesus was hanging around with a whole bunch of people that was not religious. He hated religious people. Mm-hmm. But sometimes we give our life to God. We get super religious. We get judgmental. We're looking down at our family. People don't want to hear you at the family union talking, you know, pulling out your Bible and preaching at them. Right. We're family. We come together. Yes, we're going to pray. We open up in prayer and, you know, do our activities just because somebody playing basketball and having a good time and laughing or whatever. It's not the time to always shove doctrine down their throats. You know how we win people over to God? We demonstrate Christ's love. Right. We demonstrate his love. And when I got divorced, I realized how religious I was. I realized how judgmental I was and God had to take me to a place of authenticity and he rebuilt my relationships with my family, with, you know, friends after he broke me. Mm. God broke me through this process. And now like, I like who I am today. Right. Girl. Hey, this is a real <laughs> me. I didn't even know she was in there. <laughs> hey, right. girl. Hey, girl. Hey. And here's the other thing, too. Um, a lot of times, like you said, we give our life because I've been there as well. Like when you give your life to Christ, oh, I can't go here. I can't I can't go there. Because like even a couple of months ago when I started doing karaoke, I was like, well, can I? Is there certain songs that I can sing? I need to sing. And I'm like, no, I'm just having fun. I'm just having fun. Mm-hmm. Just because I'm singing a particular song, as long as it's not disrespectful or anything. Right. But if I'm just having fun and I'm not hurting anyone, I don't see a problem with it. So now I just go to hair karaoke now and I just have to let my hair down and just mm-hmm. have fun. But a lot of times we get in our mindset, well, we can't listen to this. And now I will say now, we still have to be mindful of our eye gates, what mm-hmm. we're watching. Absolutely. What we're reading. Certain conversations we entertain now, Absolutely. certain things we still have to be mindful of, but that doesn't mean once you give your life to Christ that you stop living. Mm-hmm. You know, you can still listen to R&B. You can still, and like I said, I listen to hip hop, but there, you know, there's certain songs and I know not to listen to it. It might take me, <laughs> take me somewhere. Like, I no, know that's I, right. I, I can't, <laughs> I can't listen to that. <laughs> the thug tour going to come out. So. <laughs> Now I know I know boundaries when it comes to like like, like I said protecting my eye gates what mm-hmm. I watch what I what I read and I know for me personally like I don't watch a lot of um when it comes to, I don't like I said I don't watch a lot of television period but there's certain certain things that I know that I can't watch because it may trigger 
a trauma that I experienced. Right. And when you're going through that healing process, you have mm-hmm. to be mindful and know what trigger you. Absolutely. And know what people trigger you. Mm-hmm. And that's why sometimes periodically I take breaks from social media mm-hmm. because I may see a post on social media. It comes up in my feed and it will trigger me. Mm-hmm. And, then I'll, and I'll go back to a place that I'm trying. And it's like, here's another thing too. A lot of times we cover things up. And by covering up, we don't allow ourselves the time, the process to heal Girl. because we don't deal with the problem head on. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was doing. A, a lot of things, trauma and things that I experienced, I was covering up mm-hmm. a lot. But I wasn't I, I was thinking that I was healed from it, but I wasn't. All I was doing is just putting a Band-Aid on it and pretending like I was OK. And people said, Tori, you OK? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. When really I was not. Right. And I'm be, and I'll and I'm and I'm guilty. I still do it from time to time. But I'm learning that it's OK to trust the process and allow mm-hmm. myself the necessary time it is to heal. Now, you're going to have some people that don't understand, but it's OK. Mm hmm. And it's okay for me to, you know, if I have to distance myself from certain people. And like when you're following Christ, you have to be mindful. Like a lot of times going back to that people pleasing spirit. Oh, Lord. (laughs) You have to understand that when you decide to follow Christ, some people, it's going to cause some separation. Yeah. And you can't look back because you'll be like, what is lot wife? You looking back, Mm -hmm. you're going to turn to the pill of salt. So mm-hmm. some situations and some people I know that I cannot, like I can love them from a distance and pray for them, but I know that I can't be around them because they're going to take me back to a place that God delivered me from. Right. And that's why I'm mindful of different areas that I go, different lo- different um, venues and stuff. I can't mm-hmm. go to certain places because it'll take me back to what he delivered me from. And I'm not trying to go back. Right. Back step to what God delivered me from. I'm not trying to do that. Now, what we what I've been working on as well is, you know, when I first gave my life to Christ, I was one of those, like you said, super religious person, people. Girl. And <laughs> it's like you telling this person what well, he shouldn't do. But you know what? You know what I realized? That a lot of times some of the people that you may, when we're being judgmental, mm-hmm. you may think they're living this raggedy life. This raggedy lifestyle, but let me tell you something. God uses them the most mm-hmm. because He's married to the backslider. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that a little bit. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, as a, a mental health professional, or as a Christian, or as a human being, mm-hmm. what I've learned is that the things we identify in others mm-hmm. so readily. Mm-hmm. It's things that we might secretly uh, suffer from or mm-hmm. struggle with. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But I do realize that when I went through my pain, there were certain things that I would get so agitated about people when I first, you know, gave my life to Christ. I was like, yeah, don't do that. Mm-hmm. And I realized I had a cover. Mm-hmm. So the way I protected myself was to cast or project it onto somebody else. You're doing this bad. You're doing this bad. It's because that was a weakness. And a lot of us, we won't really be honest Mm -hmm. with what deep down what we're struggling with. And in my book, I talk about my cover. I was a cover girl. I had a cover story. I I was like, listen, look at me. I am the perfect little helper. I love me some Jesus. I'm a good wife. I'm a good mother. Look at me. That was my cover story. Yeah. But deep down, I was a broken person and didn't feel really adequate in a lot of areas of my life. And it seeped out in my marriage. It seeped out in how I raised my children. And it seeped out in how I even dealt with God's people. And it wasn't until I had the break when the marriage went awry. And my husband told me, and this is in a book, he's like, I don't want to be married anymore. I thought my whole world had ended in that moment. Mm. I thought it was over. But it made me examine myself, some bad choices that I made. It made me see me for the first time, for who I really was. We cover up things that we're embarrassed by, that we feel ashamed of. And it's an old strategy. Adam and Eve, yo, check it. They was the first one to use that strategy in scripture. Right. God had an idea. This is what I think of you. This is how I'm purposing you. Be fruitful and multiply. Satan had another idea. He comes in. He offers a, uh, offers a suggestion. 
and then we fall for it. And when we fall for it, instead of going to God and saying, I fell for this, I I messed up. We try to hide and cover it as if he doesn't know. Right. As if he doesn't already know. Right. I spend a lot of my life just covering. I said, if I be a perfect little helper, people pleasers are people who are trying to hide their insecurities, their fears, all of those kind of things. But until you really deal with yourself, you're going to find yourself constantly in those same patterns and you're going to be hurting and you're going to be unhappy. And it wasn't until I was okay that I was a teenage mother. Yeah, that was me. That's a part of my story. I was a teenage mother. I was on welfare. You know, Um, I grew up in poverty. It is what it is. Right. But through all of those experiences, it has made me an authentically loving person to help people in those sur- same circumstances and let them know it ain't over. In the book, I talk about the Peter paradox. Sometimes in church, people will make you feel like that you can't be used by God because you're a certain type of person or because you had some error in your life. Okay. It took me a long time to realize that I'm okay with God. I may not be okay with people. Right. But I'm okay with God. He he loves me. I'm good. Right. And sometimes we are more afraid of people's perception of us than we are his. Right. So learn to be okay and, and give up the cover story. I, I'm not a perfect little wife. I'm not a perfect little mother. I made a lot of mistakes. But you know what? I know who to go to to fix them. And that's what that's the whole purpose of what I do now. Like, no, I'm going through these pains. Some of these things I cause on myself. Some of these things other people cause. But at the end of the day, they're going to be for God's glory. Absolutely. <laughs> Kingdom yeah. principles. And then also, um, I want to talk about the book. Tell everyone the name of the book again. Okay. The name of the book is... Grace to Live on Purpose. I don't know if you can see it. I got my copy too. Let me get it. All right. Grace to Live on Purpose. And it is available at Barnes and Nobles online and at Amazon.com. And I, um, the book is broken down into like, it's like a self-help book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Anybody can read it. Christians and non-Christians alike, because Mm -hmm. there's some good principles in there. Um, But I do give like a scripture for people to see that I have a faith base. God, he definitely rules my life. Then I tell a little story about my experiences. And then I help people to create a strategy for themselves. So when you're reading a book chapter by chapter, you just don't hear my advice to you. Right. I give you homework. Right. To go back and like, okay, well, how do I apply this to my life? Right. And, um... Yeah, it's, wow. This book has transformed me in ways I I don't even know if I can articulate them because it made me really examine so much about my struggles. I had some major insecurities. I don't care how much I was, I'm an ordained pastor as well. And I would be in front of people preaching and teaching. And I just felt so inadequate. I never got over that 17-year-old girl who had that baby. It took me getting divorced. Wow. To say, wow, I have to face these issues right. in my life. I never got over it. I'm over it now. Thank you, God. Yeah. Um, because I always thought people were looking down at me. So it made me insecure. It made me jealous. Listen. I had to go through therapy to say, God, why do I always look at other women who seems like they have good marriages, good kids or whatever? And I start to like sink in this place of depression. A lot of women won't admit that they have a problem with jealousy. I ain't jealous of nobody. Yeah. I ain't jealous. Right. Like, no. I had to tell God, I had to look in the mirror. I was like, I am. And it's painful. Right. I see another woman that's being cared for, that was being properly loved and getting the goals that they set out. And I was jealous. Wow. Because I was asking God, why? Why did I have to be born to teenage parents, grow up in poverty, end up becoming a teenage parent? 
be on welfare, sometimes be African American, be black. Why mm-hmm. to be like this? Because mm-hmm. life been hard to me. Right. But when I, I understood that my beef was with God, people don't believe it. When you have a jealous heart, your beef is with God because you're telling God you could have did better by me. Right. When I my, never looked at it that way. Girl, when my marriage fell apart, I was angry. I talk about that in the book too. I go through the five stages of grief. I was angry. I was angry. I was like, I did everything right. I really didn't. You know, but right. we, when we go through pain, yeah. we always pretend. In our mind. <laughs> in our mind, I did everything right. <laughs> but we know we did not. <laughs> and God is here like, girl, bye. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I went through all of the stages of grief and I had to realize, no, you didn't do everything right. I love you anyway. Right. I love you anyway. So when you get over it and you stop crying and you start realizing that you can have purpose in this pain, then come see me. Right. And that's how, you know, God has put me in a place. I'm happy. I told somebody, it's been years since I've been happy. Wow. Like legit. Yeah. Like wake up, I'm laughing. I'm happy. Yeah. And that's a beautiful place to be. And to be at peace. Peace is every, peace is everything. Is everything. And that's a good place for you to wake up and happy. Because everybody can't say that. (laughs) Not be genuinely happy. No. So that's a good place to be. Mm-hmm. So tell everyone, like you can, you say, get an Amazon. Um, is there, do you have, matter of fact, give them your website and like your pages where they can contact, like say somebody may be listening to the interview and they may want to purchase the book and they may want a personal, they may want a person, the sign copy. Can they re- reach out to you directly? <laughs> yes. My website is www.iamneenicole.com. Again, that website is www.iamneenicole.com. Um, you can buy the book on my website. Also, um, I do vision coaching every year. I do an annual event where um, I teach people how to create vision boards for their lives. Um, And yeah, we conquer those goals and um, yeah, you can get my services that way. But anyway, my website is www.iamneenicole.com. So yeah. And I am the Nicole on Facebook. I have a YouTube channel that's I'm trying to get active now. Okay. Um, and it is I am Nia Nicole. Everything okay. is either Nia Nicole or I am Nia Nicole. So, yeah. Come check a girl out. And can they also inbox you on social media as well? Are you on Instagram as well? I'm on Instagram. Just recently got on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like TikTok. <laughs> I'm trying. I, I'm trying. I'm trying to figure it out. My mom, my kids always say, like, Ma, you do the most. Like, is some things need you need not be involved in like <laughs> It's fun. It's fun though. It's like for me, um, what made me uh get on TikTok was when COVID hit and I was like, you know how we instead of us doing some stuff we supposed to do, you you know, you find something you feel like you're bored. Well, you could know, I could have been reading a book, but I just got on TikTok and I actually love it. And mostly to be honest with you, I every once in a while I'll do a TikTok, but I'm not on there like that. I just like mostly to watch them, but it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And then there's inspirational t- TikToks on there as well. There's like there's a there's a side of um TikTok that seems like it's the Christian side of TikTok. So it's it, I think TikTok is really cool. In 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 all type of um, social media platforms, it's all in, in direction that you go because there's like Clubhouse, and you have to be careful with different rooms. But in that's with any social type of social media, you just have to be careful. You know, just you, you just use wisdom. Absolutely. Absolutely. Use wisdom. That's all I would advise anyone to do. But I thank you so much for coming on now. If what piece of advice would you give to anyone? Just like you said, you was a teen mom um, that may come from a place of brokenness and feel like because a lot of times God uses our broken pieces mm-hmm. to rebuild us, restore us and, you know, start over again. So what do you say to that person that may whatever the situation may be they may feel broken and they feel like there's no hope Mm -hmm. and they may be going through depression and you know all that type of things because I mean we all have been there where we go to these dark places and sometimes Mm -hmm. it feel like you don't know your way out of that dark place girl so what do you say to someone that may be watching that may be in a dark place and they're trying to come out and and may may not even know how to come out Mm -hmm. know that you are born on purpose. 
that's it. Know that you were born on purpose. Um, I was reading a book, Purpose Driven Life, I believe it was. And it says that your parents may not have planned you, but God did. So no matter what circumstances you were born, I was born to teenage parents. My children were born to teenage parents. Some people's parents didn't work out. Some people don't know their biological father or parents adopted, whatever. But you're here. Right. You're alive. So you're purposed. And um, we didn't talk a lot about, that's my advice, just know you have a purpose. And then, you know, live your life trying to figure it out. We didn't talk a lot about mental health. And I don't know where we are with the... the you can touch uh, on that because actually July is uh, Minority Mental Health Awareness. So you can touch on that. Yeah, I just want to share a little bit about that. I um, work in New Jersey Children's System of Care, providing mental health services for kids. And I used to do it for adults as well. In our communities, there's so much stigma about people going to get help. But I'm going to encourage someone today. Go and get some help. Go and see somebody. I had to be in therapy for three years when I realized all of the traumas that I had experienced in my life. See, we talked about covering up, covering up, covering up. I was going to church and still never dealing with the traumas. I was praising the Lord. I told you I was an ordained pastor and still never dealing with the traumas. It was almost easy for me to hide in there. Because I was going to church, I was faithful or whatever, but I was suffering from depression. It was so heavy. I told you, I, there were times I was suicidal, like legit, wanted to take my life. And people won't say that. They're so embarrassed because people think, oh, you don't have faith. No way right. a Christian should feel that way. Right. There's no way. But when you don't deal with trauma and you don't even understand, sometimes we have depression, anxiety, all kinds of things that could be biological. People have mental illness. You know, people have mental illness in the church. Mm -hmm. But people are like, oh, no, mm -mm, it's a demon. No, I have a mental illness and I need help. And I need prayer and I need a therapist and it's okay. Right. So um, one of the things I learned is that you have to be honest with what's going on with you. Trauma changes your brain chemistry. People don't know that. If you had physical abuse, sexual abuse, I can talk about that all day, every day. That would take too long. It will be a whole other show. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people, things that people go through that they don't deal with. So physiologically, it changes your brain and your body, how you react to things. You don't know why you have the triggers or why you start having bodily sensations about certain things. You feel anxious. You feel like literally heart palpitations or whatever, it's because trauma has changed you. And the only way to be able to get healed from that trauma is, first of all, admitting it, acknowledging it. Some stories that people have, they've never told another soul. They've never told another soul. So all of that stuff is just living in there. And we're just going about our business. Like everything is okay, but it's not. Mm. And it wasn't until, like I said, I, you know, my husband... And I both had childhood traumas before we got married. And we brought them together and we traumatized each other. <laughs> right. And it's just the truth. Now, let me ask you this. When you say that both of you had trauma, have you heard of the term the trauma bond? Like, Absolutely. <laughs> like you're attracted to someone, like you have trauma and, and that what brings the attraction? Mm -hmm. Is that is that really, because I, explain that because I heard the term, but I don't fully, I didn't fully understand. I was wondering if it's because, the, because both of you experience trauma, is that mm -hmm. what draws the attraction? Trauma bonds are real. They're real. And what usually happens is that when you experience something, whether it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, mental abuse, your brain try to figure out ways to adapt to it. Okay. So it changes how you see life, how you perceive reality. And how you go about, you know, relationships. So there was something he saw, he said he saw in me. And at the time, I didn't realize that I seen something in him that I was trying to regain from my childhood. 
and us coming together, we were triggering each other all the time. You know, we both seen domestic abuse, infidelity, all kinds of things. And then when we got together, we were bonded by that. We shared each other's story. And it's like, oh, and I felt like I'm going to heal him. He's going to heal me. But we ended up hurting each other right. because we didn't really deal with the trauma. Just sharing a story is not good enough. You got to go and get some help. It's so many relationships are out there. I don't even know how, why I'm going down this road. People are hurting and they're not getting the help that they need. And they're just hurting each other more. And anyway, the physical attraction, the emotional attachment, why you can't leave a person that's abusive because you're trauma bound, bounded, 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 however you want to say it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're literally addicted. They said when you experience trauma, something sparks off in your brain like um, endorphins. OK, mm -hmm. so some people overeat. Some people use drugs and alcohol. Some people engage in illicit sexual affairs or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's their brain trying to release that pleasure. So when you're in a, a trauma bonded relationship, it's an addiction. Mm -hmm. It's an addiction. It's like, well, I can't leave this person alone. And I know it's not good for me. Right. I'm physically addicted to this person. And you know what you, you, you reminded me, I was thinking because I had a relationship where I was thinking, why can't I leave this person? Mm -hmm. And I feel as though a lot of times we use that term toxic. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think that when a person is toxic, it just means that they need healing. Mm -hmm. And I'm the type of person where I feel like used to feel like I could heal this person or I could fix them. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking by me being a good person, that's going to make them good. Mm -hmm. But that's not how it works. Because toxic people, they need help. They need it. it but I, and I used to have this thing where I could save the world when I can't. Mm -hmm. I cannot save the world. But a lot of times, instead of us uh, calling someone toxic or this and that the third, we should be praying for them and see if we can do something to see if they can seek the help. Mm hmm. Because like it's like I was asking you earlier, sometimes you have to know the difference between somebody that you have to be patient with mm -hmm. and someone that you have to distance yourself from. But that doesn't stop you from praying from anybody. Right. Prayer is free and prayer can change things. Absolutely. Along with therapy. <laughs> Absolutely. And I want to say this, too, though. Healing others starts with healing yourself. Mm hmm. People pleasers, perfect little helpers, they project onto other people because they are too afraid to be vulnerable and deal with their brokenness or inadequacies. So it's okay. I'm going to fix you so I don't have to focus on fixing me. Right. And that's what we do. It's so easy to see someone who's like, oh, yeah, this man, he got issues. He's toxic. He's narcissistic. I, I, There are people that are narcissistic and there are people who actually have narcissistic personality disorder. It's a diagnosed mental illness. It's true. But everybody you deal with is not a narcissist. I'm sorry. Right. Like, it's, it's a whole big thing going on. I was like, oh, I'm so annoyed with y'all right <laughs> Enough already. Right. Enough already. Right. But the thing is, if you are constantly dealing with a so-called narcissist, then what are you getting out of it? What are you getting? You need to examine what's going on with you mm -hmm. that you keep drawing to these type of people. And it's not just in a romantic relationship. Friendships, you know, even you can be in you know, family relationships, whatever. And you, you align yourself often with these certain type of people. What are you missing? What's going on with you? Healing starts with the individual. You can't fix somebody else until you know what the problem is in you. And that's what I learned. I was a perfect little fixer. And in my book, I talk about, um, he came back for me. That's one of the chapters in the book. And I talked about when my mom and dad had me, they were teenagers. My mom was 17, like gener told about generational curses. They doing great too. And my mom and dad doing, they bomb. But they were teenagers. My dad was 19. My mom was 17. And um, 
my dad was just coming up to New Jersey to hang out with his family for a little while. He was from South Carolina. This is where he's from. So he met this girl, my mom, you know, she was banging, as I was told. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they hooked up, had a little quick romance, and he moved back home. But then he found out that she was pregnant, so he came back to New Jersey. And because my dad was like, he was a smart guy, a hardworking guy, everybody was like, he's going to do this, great things, whatever. And when those things didn't happen for my dad, I somehow associated that with him sacrificing and coming back from me. So I spent my earlier parts of my life trying to please him and then trying to please other men because I felt like my birth somehow ruined my dad's chances of success. And I had to go three years of therapy to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And I said that to say this, perfect little helpers, there's a root calls to it you got to find out what that is what's your issue what's going on with you and today I'm living with my parents right now until I, um, I buy a house and it's been like the most healing experience my mom and dad is still together by the way and I'm 45 so God yeah. can heal you know he can do all of those good things but I don't know I, I just I think what I want people to know about the book and about me is that I evolved in my life after the pain. I found purpose when I was able to be naked, vulnerable, true, authentic, my whole story. I was so embarrassed by being a teenage mom, being on welfare, all these things. And I said, once I get my education, sis, I'm going to be acting prim and proper. Right. So I'm like, I got a master's degree. Don't right. nobody care, child. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Don't nobody care. Don't nobody care. But I, it's, it was something that I had to kind of, you know, get over in myself. But I'm just glad every part of me, the educated part of me, the hood part of me, the Jersey girl. Yeah. I love her all. I love all of her. Silly part. Right. You know, the girl who looks pretty with this makeup on and the girl who look like, ooh, you look a whole hot mess. <laughs> I love her all. Right. I love all of her. But anyway. Yeah. You have to love us in the midst of our scars because I, I feel like our scars are our beauty marks. Mm -hmm. They are our beauty marks. There's beauty that comes from the ashes. But anyway, we're going to talk, 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 talk. But I thank you so much um, for coming. And you guys have got to get this book. It's called uh, Grace for a Living. Let me see if I put in the camera right. Y'all, this book is so good. I read this book. Well, I'm an avid reader anyway. You know how you know I read this book in like two days, right? <laughs> Literally two days. Like I was up, I, I started reading the book. Matter of fact, I started reading it Friday at the karaoke. I read to probably about one, two o'clock in the morning. And I finished the book the next day. Wow. Now everybody can't read, probably don't like to read, but I like to read. And it was it was that good. It's like a page turner. So you guys have got to get this book. And tell everyone again your social media platforms that they can reach out to you. And I'll also repeat your website before we wrap up. Okay. So you can buy the book at my website, and that is ww.imnicole.com. Or you can buy it on Barnes and Nobles online or on Amazon. Um, I can be reached on social media. I think it's Nia Nicole on Facebook. I am Nia Nicole on Instagram and I, I am Nia Nicole on my YouTube. So okay. I'm trying to make that, um, a little bit popping. Okay. <laughs> so go follow me on YouTube. <laughs> I will subscribe. <laughs> subscribe. That's see. Subscribe. See, my kids told me to stay away from social media. Mom, you doing the most. Yeah, when you when you talk about uh, YouTube, you gotta say you gotta say subscribe. <laughs> well, subscribe to my page. And make sure you sh you have to um tell people to subscribe, hit the notifications so they can get the alerts when you um uh, get a new uh, video. So yeah, but thank you guys for watching. If you missed the beginning of the podcast, you can go to the replay. And if you'd like to be a guest on the Keep the Faith podcast, you can contact me at 843-920-8124. That's 843-920-8124. Or you can email me at faithisnecessary at gmail.com. And as I always say at the end of the show, no matter what you're going through, always remember you may bend, but don't break. And always remember to keep the faith. And thank you guys for watching. Bye, y'all.
Okay. Hang on. We still live. The mouse. 